Okay, thanks everybody for joining us. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, this is Chuck, I'm out here at Midori Farm. It's a beautiful day and we're starting our community farm today. I've gotten a grant from the Natsuhara Grant Foundation to start a community farm and we're gonna focus on sweet potatoes this year. It was my original goal to have several people out here in the numbers of 30 to 40 people to help me get started, but due to restrictions with our health and safety, I've decided to bring just a small squadron of people up to help me out today, but hopefully next month we'll be able to have a larger group out to continue this program. As you know, my name is Chuck and I'm from the USA. I'm gonna introduce some of my other uh, participants today. I'm Peter uh, from Canada. I'm David, I'm from France. Oscar. Miami san Ah, good morning. What you said? What is your name and where are you ah, from? I'm Oscar, Oscar Gulaev from Israel, Haifa. <laughs> Thank you. Miami san Your name and where you're from? Hi, I'm Mayumi. I'm from Osaka. Thank you. Thank you. Junya. Where, what's your name and where are you from? My name is Junior and I am from Kyoto. <laughs> Pia? Hi, I'm Pia, so I'm come from France. Hello. So we have quite a nice international group out here today helping out. And as I said, we're getting this bed ready for sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are fairly easy to grow and they're very popular in Japan, which is why I chose them. I've been farming in this area for about uh, 12 or 13 years, and uh, I've been learning a lot. I did not go to farm school or have any sort of experience on a farm before I started, so it was all kind of trial and error for me. And I've learned a lot over this past decade, and I'm sure I'll continue learning the more I farm. But one thing I did learn is that a lot of Japanese people used to have the experience to go out to their grandfathers or their uncles or their friends sweet potato farm as kids, and harvest sweet potatoes. Um, especially in kindergartens and elementary school, this was a very popular activity. For most people in the age range of about 30 to about 60 have had this experience. But I've noticed recently a lot more farms are going industrial and conventional with lots of chemicals and they don't really uh, suitable for such an event. So it's becoming uh, a more rare opportunity for people to come out and uh, experience farming and harvest sweet potatoes. So I decided to apply for this grant this year to um, kind of restart this tradition in Japan, giving people the opportunity to learn about agriculture, touch the soil with their hands, feel the joy of pulling a sweet potato from the field and then taking it home and eating it. So this program is again sponsored by Natsuhara Grant, Arigato gozaimashita. We will take you through the whole process of taking a fallow field like this one. This, has, this field has not been used for at least two or three years. We're gonna clean it up, we're gonna prepare the soil, and we're gonna plant out our sweet potato starts. And then through the course of the year, we're gonna come back and uh, tend to the sweet potato starts, do the weeding, build a fence, and then eventually we're gonna be harvesting the leaves to eat, and then eventually harvesting the tubers, of course, taking you through the curing process that we follow here, and then for some recipes and people can take some home. So this is a one, this project will probably be about six or seven months long in total. And this is our first day, so thank you so much for joining us. Starting at about 11.20, which is in about how long, Brian? 15 minutes, thank you, Brian. Brian's our behind the camera man. He's super great, he's from England. And uh, in about 15 minutes, we're gonna unmute your microphones and take your wonderful questions. I'm looking forward to those. Until then, I'm just gonna take you through what we're doing here to get these, this bed ready for planting. So, we've got lots of tools and you can't come in close because the camera doesn't move so well, but perhaps you can see that all this green stuff shouldn't be here. So we're basically pulling out this green stuff, either by hand or by tool, and then we're gonna stack that up into baskets and uh, put it on the side. And then there's all this black plastic here as well that needs to come up before we can plant out. So that's basically what we're doing today is removing a lot of vines and weeds and things like that. Now, there's pretty much a few rules when it comes to removing weeds. The rule that I like to follow 
is you can cut a weed a thousand times or pull it only once. So I prefer to pull the weeds. And it's often nice to have a tool like this one to help you out. If you loosen the soil around the weeds like this, it becomes a lot easier to get the whole weed out with the root. Because a lot of these weeds are so hardy that you can pull the top off them and they will just keep on coming. So we use a little hand hoe like this one, kind of break up the soil. And this brings us closer to our goal of getting the soil mixed up and soft for the sweet potatoes to be planted out. We also taken out their stones if we can and somebody actually found the, the jawbone to a deer that happened to die on this property. The building behind me you see is a barn and then further on there is a kuda and beyond that is a large house. This whole complex belongs to uh, an elderly gentleman and uh, he was kind enough to offer us this field to use this year for a, a small rental fee and uh, he's actually a hunter and what he does is he hunts uh, the animals in the valley and it's been his role and his family's role for generations. He told me uh, just last year that he's 17th generation to live in this house and on this complex and basically following this lifestyle of uh, hunting and uh, growing rice and vegetables. And uh, he's about 80 years old now. But I think you can imagine if it's uh, 16 generations, that's well over 300 years, if not 400 years, his family's been living here. And his son, um, who's a wonderful gentleman, has, just has no interest in following this lifestyle. So he's sad that he's the last one. He'll be the final one in, this, in his, in his li lineage to, to follow this lifestyle. So when he and I became friends a few years ago, he was happy to see that there is somebody who's younger wanting to continue this sort of lifestyle and uh, bring some vitality and youth to the village. I'm uh, nearly 50, but I'm about the youngest person here. So it is kind of nice, <laughs> but it is also kind of sad. So um, what I've been doing over the past 12 years is taking some other fallow fields in different locations nearby here and changing them into very fertile vegetable fields and then selling those vegetables in Kyoto City. Um, so what we're doing today is vital to uh, any sort of gardening or farming, which is to reduce the weeds. Now, re we reduce the weeds because the weeds will compete with the vegetables for nutrients and sunlight and water. So we need to make sure we have them somewhat under control before we put out our sweet potato starts. Otherwise, our sweet potato starts just won't have a chance. <clears throat> also, for sweet potatoes, it's important that the soil is fairly loose. If the soil is really compacted and hard, um, as you can imagine, the sweet potato grows into the soil, it's gonna have a hard time penetrating that soil and it'll get really strange shape and it won't get very big because it can't move very much in that compacted soil. So we'll take tools like this and we'll really mix the soil up like this and we'll add some soil amendments. Soil amendments are basically food for the plants. And this food can be uh, in a lot of different ways. I mean, a lot of people grow uh, conventionally and what they do is they put chemicals, chemical food into the soil, chemical fertilizers and stuff like that. Um, I'm an organic farmer, so I don't use chemicals, but I do still need to put something in there to feed my plants. So what I do is I use things like uh, manures and compost. And that's what sweet potatoes really like and uh, all plants benefit from compost. So compost is basically taking uh, vegetable matter and fruit matter and composting it down to turn it into something that looks just like soil. And then that's full of a, a very healthy bacteria that can uh, um, feed the plants and uh, keep the soil healthy and, uh, and productive. <clears throat> Just a moment, please. Um, sorry, we've got a, lot of, a visitor today, a rice farmer, who uh, didn't expect to see us here. So somebody's going to go talk to him and explain why, why our field is, uh, why our cars are blocking his tractor. <laughs> So Sunday is a work day for a lot of people um, out here because uh, they have day, they have week jobs in the city, and uh, so they only have the weekend to, uh, to to do their farming and gardening activities. So he's gonna he's gonna keep doing that while I'm doing this. 
what I am seeing as I'm pulling up these weeds is I'm seeing a lot of worms. Are you guys also seeing a lot of worms? Yeah, good, good. Worms are a great sign of healthy soil. Worms can't live in soil that's too dry or too heavy in clay or too full of chemicals. So worms are a great sign. Worm, what worms do for the soil is almost magical. They'll consume any sort of dying and decaying uh, vegetable matter. And their castings or their, their uh, feces is incredibly good for farmer's soil. Um, the plant, it's just full of nutrition and they basically make super soil. So when you see worms in your, in your garden, be very, very happy that they're there. So we're gonna do everything we can to make sure we don't kill them as we're working here. How's our time, Brian? All right, good. Very, very good. One of the other benefits to growing here is that uh, we're in the mountains and there's fresh mountain water. And that mountain water is so delicious to drink and it's so good for the vegetables as well. And we have basically an endless supply of it because it's always running down the mountain and into the river that's uh, off there to the left. So uh, it's really nice to have a steady supply of good, healthy water for our vegetables. <clears throat> basically, we're situated about uh, 50 kilometers north of city center of Kyoto, uh, up in the mountains of Shiga. And uh, this location I was lucky enough to find because I had an English student at my school about uh, 16 years ago, who uh, is an artist. She's a ceramist with her husband. And um, she had a workshop up here. She lived in the city of Kyoto and had a workshop up here. And we became friends. And then she decided, okay, well, Chuck, why don't you go up to my uh, workshop in the mountains and go camping? I said, okay, that sounds good. And uh, I just fell in love with it. I just couldn't get enough of coming up here and camping and playing in the river, fishing and exploring and hiking. <clears throat> until, and then I came up here in the winter one time and it was so full of snow that I fell in love with it all over again because I'm from uh, near the city of Chicago and uh, growing up, we always had lots of snow and uh, lots of snow meant no school. So whenever I see lots of snow, I always get excited even as an, an older person. And uh, so even to this day, we uh, come out here in the winter time with my son, Junior, who you met earlier and uh, some of his friends or some of our family friends and we all go sledding together. We've done that for, gosh, about 12 years now. The, uh, the shocking thing is how much uh, climate change has affected our climate here. Our, uh, our winters have become so much more warmer. And uh, when we first started coming here, there was no less than a meter of snow on the ground for three to four months. Whereas uh, this past winter, we got uh, maybe a maximum of 30 centimeters. And uh, it was really sad um, because the ecosystem is, is balanced for having that much snow for that long of a time. And um, <coughs> it's just uh, very shocking to the residents. And uh, I think all the animals that live here as well and the insects and the birds, um, things are just trying to reset and figure themselves out again. Um, I, I've seen dragonflies come back earlier than ever. I've seen the ducks come back earlier than ever. Um, all the insect pressure is getting bigger and bigger. Last year was really bad, this year's gonna be worse. So we organic farmers, especially who don't spray chemicals, are gonna suffer a lot for this climate change. So, which is one reason I encourage people to go out to nature and enjoy it and respect it and love it and wanna protect it and to learn about climate change and how we can reduce our impact on it. So I do everything I can to do that on a personal level. <clears throat> and Midori Farm is dedicated to the idea of doing that as well. Um, like I said, we don't spray chemicals. We don't use plastics unless absolutely necessary. And um, when we deliver baskets of vegetables, nothing's wrapped in plastic. It's all just in a big open basket. And it's uh, basically uh, farm to table for everybody. And uh, some of the people here are actually my customers. They buy vegetables from me, which is great. And some of them are just friends. I have about 15 to 25 customers a week. 
and uh, they're all living in and around Kyoto City. And I want to say a big thank you to all of them. Thank you for buying my vegetables and supporting and believing in me. Like I said, I'm not a trained farmer. I'm not an educated farmer, except self-educated through the internet and uh, podcasts and things like that. And through a lot of mistakes and a lot of trial and error. Um, but this is something, this organic farming is something that's really taken hold of me. It's really become my calling. Uh, what started is just kind of a hobby about 15 years ago. To Basically, I'd come up here, like I said, to go camping and sledding. And I think I was just looking for an excuse to stay up here and to come up here more and more. And what happened was uh, my friends who had their place up here, they decided to move here. And after that, I'm like, well, I'll, I want to get a place up here, you know. So we, they were looking for a place for me to buy. <laughs> and they finally found a spot. And it was really hard to find a place because they said the local people, even though they're not using their houses and stuff, they don't want to sell the land because it's been in their family for so many generations. They actually feel like they're selling part of their ancestors. off. It was hard for me to understand that, but finally I came around to understanding, okay, well, and they, when they did find a place for me to buy, I said, oh, that's great, wonderful. And we set a price and I went to the, land, to the uh, estate office, the, uh, the town hall, to, to write up the deed to transfer sale. And it was, it was such an old deed uh, that the man had that uh, they said, sorry, this is too old. We have to rezone the property and it's gonna double the cost. So I couldn't buy it. So instead they said, uh, sorry, we can't let you buy it. And the owner was so sad and so, uh, so sorry about that. He said, Chuck, why don't you just use it as a garden? You know, it's just a small piece of land, but he was, his wife was using it as a, as a garden and she passed away. So he said, just use it as a garden. But I had no interest in using it as a garden. <laughs> I wanted to build a log cabin. But my friends who lived here, they said, Chuck, you should probably consider this if you start using it as a garden and you're here regularly, then people will see you and the local people will see you. And they'll say, oh, there's Chuck. Yeah, we know Chuck. And then if they want to sell a piece of land, they'll be more friendly and more willing to do so. So that's what I did. And that was uh, 13 or 14 years ago that I started farming completely on accident, just so that people could see me, so I could buy a different piece of land. And uh, after a year or two, it, uh, it became sort of an obsession with me. I lost my interest in building a log cabin and buying land, and I just wanted to come up and grow vegetables more and more. It started out as once every month, to uh, twice a month, to three times a month, to once a week, to twice a week, and now I'm coming up here three days a week. And uh, yeah, it's really taken a hold of me. Like I said, it's become some sort of a vocation for me because I know how it makes me feel to be up here. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful being serenaded by the birds and the frogs and the insects every day and uh, feeling so connected to nature and the environment to be producing something that's so vital to us, uh, to produce it organically and to know that not only am I creating a resource that's absolutely necessary for everyone because we all need to eat that I'm doing it in such a way that's in balance with the environment and helping out my community as well so it's very very rewarding um, but like I said it's it's been a long journey and I've got a long journey ahead of me but it's starting to become more popular these days for people to start their own gardens and uh, to be interested in eating more organic food and local food so I guess I'm kind of in the right place at the right time with uh, climate change and coronavirus because I'm able to still have connection with the land and food and still have some sovereignty over my life because uh, that's really important for people to feel safe and secure and healthy and happy. Well, that's about it for our 20 minute spiel. Um, pretty long winded, so sorry about that, but we're gonna open up the microphone so people can ask questions. <clears throat> Can you find it, Brian? I think it's under participants. Unmute all, please. 
Okay, I'm open for questions. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> Hello, do you have any questions out there? Anybody's willing to ask a question? Yes, how do you know when the harvest? Sorry, can you say that again? How do you know when to harvest a sweet potato? Oh, can you ask who's speaking, please? Hello. It's Kim. Oh, Kim. Hello, Kim. It's how do I know when the sweet potatoes are ready to harvest is your question. Yes. Okay, that's a good question. Sweet potatoes are basically ready to harvest at any time after the vines have reached a length of about two meters. Um, and some people harvest them right away to get the smaller ones that you see for uh, barbecues and stuff. But what I personally like to do, and this is the same rule with potatoes, which are about the same, is I let them go until basically the vines are dead or die, dying severely, because then I know I've got maximum size and maximum growth on my sweet potatoes. It really depends on the farmer and how they're doing it, because some farmers are, want to get that out of there so they can move in the next crop. But I always leave my bed, you know, dedicated to sweet potatoes for the whole season. So I don't, I'm not in that sort of hurry. So I let my sweet potatoes get nice and big. The biggest ones that I've gotten have been about almost the size of a volleyball and uh, weighing about two to three kilograms each. But um, so the, the short answer to your question is when the vines get to be about two meters, they're ready. Um, but the longer answer is it really depends on how big a sweet potato is. Great. Thanks, Kim. Anybody else have questions? Me again, Kim again. Yes, okay, Kim, yes, go. How can I get to make those wonderful baked potatoes in my house with no oven? How do you make a baked, pota baked sweet potato, you mean? Yeah, you know how they're very caramely and sweet at the store. Oh, yeah, 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 the sweet potatoes. Yeah, 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 the yaki emo. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I've actually only done those once and I did them in a campfire wrapped in aluminum foil. Okay. Um, basically, the best ones to get for those are the smaller ones. They're about this long and, you know, not very big around. Mm. And uh, keep the skin on them, wrap them in foil and put them in coals for, you know, about 30 minutes to an hour, depending when they feel soft, they're ready. Oh, okay. um, I, I, I like the way the Japanese do it with the rocks because the rocks kind of keep their temperature down so they don't get too hot or too cold and mm. it gets, cook, cook it low and slow kind of thing. How many, how many varieties of sweet potato are you doing? This year, I'm going to do four or five varieties. I, I had to buy my starts this year because uh, I tried to grow some out and they're just taking too long. So I went ahead and bought some at the home center. And uh, yeah, I've got some good kinds. Uh, maybe I should bring those in. Brian, could you bring one of each variety of those packs over there? Um, there's so many different kinds of sweet potatoes and sweet potatoes originate in uh, South America, of course. And there they have true yams as well. Whereas most people here have never even seen a yam. Uh, these are just sweet potatoes. So this is Beni Azuma. This is probably the most common one you'll see in the shop. It's just got a pinkish skin and it's got a whitish, yellowish whitish interior. Thank you, Brian. This is called, I think there's actually one or two more varieties. This one's called a purple sweet road. And this will be purple inside. And these are really healthy. They're also called Murasaki Imo. This one is called a Keen Toki. And this one's also a popular one. Uh, it's basically the same as the uh, Beniazuma, a little bit sweeter maybe. And uh, uh, Keen Toki, we got it. But there is one more variety over there. Maybe the... Yeah. I tell you, the home centers in the city have nothing on the home centers in the country because people are really growing a lot more vegetables and doing more farming and stuff in the countryside. So living in the city, um, 
it's tough to get the good stuff, so I have to go out of my way to go on my way to the farm to get the good transplants. And once you find a good home center, it's it, it's it's just a, like a great restaurant. It's uh, the kind of thing that uh, you want to go back again and again and again. Having any luck, Brian? Benny Haddock. Uh, Benny Haddock. No, I haven't had that one. Yeah, this is uh, Benny Haruka, and this is more of an orange inside. And I think there's actually one more kind. Um, it's got kind of a brownish skin. Ano, ano Imo, I think it's called. No, oh, that would be it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So this is the last one. And this is the one that's kind of orangish inside with a brown skin. And when you go for yaki imo in the shops, sometimes they have this one, it's always more expensive. So it's the first year I'm growing all these um, different varieties. So I'm really excited. I'll plant a bed of each and then we'll be able to taste test and uh, find some good recipes for everyone. Thanks for the question. Yeah, it's fun. It's very fun. So again, I can't see anybody. If there's anybody else who has a question, I'd be happy to answer. Hello, it's Helen. Uh, we have a question actually. Uh, yes. Do you use heirloom plants and how do you regrow from one year to another the sweet potatoes? That's a very good question. Very, very good question. Can I ask who's talking, please? Um, I'm sorry, what's your name? Helene. Helene, okay, thank you very much, Helene. Um, so sweet potatoes and potatoes are very different plants, but they grow kind of similar. When you plant a potato plant, basically you're planting a potato. Um, when you're planting a sweet potato plant, basically you take a sweet potato and you put it in water or in soil and you let these little slips grow out the top of it. And then you, you dislocate those slips and they have little root nodules on it. They sometimes you put in water to grow the roots a little bit. And those are what you plant into the soil. So just about any sweet potato is like this. Um, I don't think there's really very many non heirloom sweet potatoes out there. I don't know, but I have taken year after year my own sweet potatoes, simply put them in soil or water, grow out some slips and plant those again and again and again. And that's the easiest best way to do is to grow them yourself and just to keep the cycle going. And I do that same with potatoes. This year I'm trying all these varieties. I haven't had the chance to research them deeply about if they're heirloom or not, but I'm fairly confident that when we harvest these out and then store them and then next spring, they'll start to kind of go funny a little bit. And from those, I will just plant some in the soil or in some water, grow out the slips and I'll be <laughs> continuing the cycle. So it's kind of a big circle with sweet potatoes and potatoes. They're some of my favorite crops because they're so sustainable. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Helene. Chuck, some participants are having problems with their mics and are, they can't mute or, or unmute themselves. So maybe if they could type in the comments and we could read the questions. Oh, yes. So if anybody's having trouble unmuting their microphone or getting it to work, please type, type in your comment and then we can read it and we can answer your questions. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, this Zoom is, is new to me as well, so it's a bit glitchy on my end as well. I, I'm sorry for all the troubles if it's causing you. While everybody's getting ready, I have a technical question. Uh, sure, go ahead. What, what's your, your outfit that you're using, your, your mic and headphones? Oh, I don't know. It's just something I bought online. It's not a very special one. It's just a wireless, you know, Bluetooth microphone headset. Okay, thank yeah, you. I actually bought it to listen to music when I was riding my motorcycle, but it's turned into my Zoom microphone setup. So. <laughs> okay, no questions yet. I guess not. Uh, hey, Brian, what time is it? Okay, so I think it's time for us to go back to work. Hopefully people will get their issues sorted and be able to ask their questions in about five more minutes. So I'm just gonna go back to work here. And uh, if you do have other questions though, please keep them for, for 20 minutes and then ask me again towards the end of the, uh, the video here. So go ahead and mute the microphones please, so we can get back to work. Ah.
Okay. Okay, very good. I've just found this kind of critter in the ground and I'm gonna bring it up closer to the microphone. He's actually biting me pretty hard, but fortunately he's got small jaws. Hey, Junior. Junior, come here. So this is a baby beetle. Junior, what do you call a baby beetle? Yochu. Yochu, that's right, yochu. And the adult is? Seichu. Seichu, that's right. So this yochu, it's hard to identify what kind of beetle this is, but uh, it's small, so it's not gonna be a very big beetle. And uh, most of you are probably aware of this, but beetles in Japan can be extremely huge. The kabutomushi and the kuagata are very, very large, and they're often uh, pets for kids, um, which was really surprising to me when I came here from the States. I'd never seen beetles as pets, because uh, we don't have such interesting large beetles in the States. But here, their beetles are so cool. So um, when I started farming here, I would start finding these yochu, or uh, larva, beetle larva, uh, sometimes when I was digging in the dirt. and. Uh, I thought, oh my God, I found one that's uh, this big. It must be for the big giant beetle. And we grew it out and it was just a kanaboon or a Japanese beetle, which was kind of plain. So we were very disappointed. But then when I started my composting, I started finding beetles that were bigger than my finger or beetle grubs that were bigger than my finger. They're about this long and about this big around. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're almost as big as a hot dog. Those are the babies for the, the kabutomushi, the stag beetles and the kuagata. So that was very interesting for me to be able to see and uh, watch them grow up into beetles and then see the adult beetles as well. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I threw the beetle grub away. What did you find in the pond? A turtle. A turtle? Mm. Well, go back there and see, see if you can find it again. Mm, too muddy. Too muddy. Oh, okay. You can't see anything. Can't see anything. Okay. How about we got a picture of a new Oh, okay. A perfect picture. A perfect picture. And you have a spider in your boot. A spider in my boot? Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully he's not going to do anything wrong. Here, why don't you talk to the camera a bit and tell us, tell everybody what you like about Kutsuki. Me? Yeah. I just like the animals. Which animals do you like best? Uh, like the snakes, birds, hawks, definitely hawks, and fish, bugs, and yeah, reptiles. How long have you been coming up here? Uh, about five years. Actually, you came up here when you were one. Oh. So eight years? Yeah, eight years. But you don't remember that, of course. Yes. But you've been sledding here since you were two. Yes. Been swimming in the river since you were three. Yes. Catching newts in the river since you were four. Yes. And uh, swimming under the river with the newts when you were five. Yes. And now you're the butterfly killer. Why don't you tell us about that? I hate butterflies! <laughs> Why does it pop? Why do I hate butterflies? Because the butterflies lay eggs on the cabbage and then the eggs hatch it and then the baby butterfly, the yochu, it comes out, the grub comes out and then it eats all of the cabbage and then we don't have any more cabbage and we can use cabbage in a really lot of ways. That's right, we love cabbage, right? Yes. And what's, what's a butterfly yochu called in English? Butterfly yochu is called in English? Yeah. It's called a caterpillar. That's right. And what's it called in Japanese? Aomushi. Aomushi. There's lots of different caterpillars up here. Some yes. of them are really pretty and there's beautiful butterflies as well and moths as well. But unfortunately, most organic farmers who don't grow with, with a lot of protection are kind of the opposite to everybody else. We love bees. Vegetables. Well, yes, we do love vegetables. We also love bees. Yep. Why do we love bees? Because they make pollen and pollen they, makes... They don't make the pollen. Ah, the they, flowers make the pollen. Yeah, yeah. The flowers make the po pollen. The bees get the pollen in their mouth, like... <laughs> their bodies and then their mouths. And then they go to another flower. They do that again and again. And they do vegetables too. And then the vegetable becomes extremely bitter. <laughs> That's right. So we love bees, bees and we don't like... Butterflies. That's right. We're kind of weird that way. Thank you, Junior. Have fun. Yep. Yeah, I tell you, it's great to have a child out here, especially my own child, because that's the future. If I can instill in him the appreciation for, her, and gosh, if, if possible at all, the love for agriculture and nature, 
then he'll carry that forward when he gets to be older and he'll teach it and so on and so on. So that's really one of my goals out here is not only my own family, which is of course very important to me, but for everybody out there to be able to have a chance to see what's possible. Again, I am not a professional. You don't have to do it my way. And in fact, I encourage you to find your own way to do things. But like I said, I've been doing this for over 10 years. I've figured out some of it. You know, I'm pretty good at some of it. I wouldn't call myself a professional, of course, for, for this, because there are people who are much smarter and better at it than I am. But in any situation, all farmers across the world are combating the same thing, which is climate change. And again, I'm gonna say this, please do what you can to research about climate change, to find out how you can reduce your impact. Um, personally, what I do is I've given up eating meat. Um, that's a huge one. The meat industry is very polluting. <clears throat> I also greatly reduce my plastic usage. Um, I never ever buy a pet bottle, ever. Um, so that's a great reduction. And uh, also, I don't wrap my vegetables in plastic, which is great. I've reduced my plastic in a lot of different ways. Unfortunately, I need a vehicle. I need to drive the hour and 10 minutes from my house to my farm three days a week. So that's very polluting. So I'm doing as much as I can to offset that uh, by producing organic vegetables naturally. And I've also started a composting problem program, not problem, <laughs> a composting program. Um, composting is a fantastic way to reduce your carbon footprint and kind of turn it around and make a positive because what composting is, is you're taking your vegetable and fruit scraps from your kitchen and instead of putting them in your trash, which is either put into a landfill or incinerated, and in Japan it's incinerated, instead you're taking that and you're mixing it with some dry materials like grass or leaves or rice chaff or something like that. And then you're creating this wonderful soil amendment for your garden and your farm. And it's incredible for the environment and it puts that carbon into the soil instead of burning it and releasing it as carbon dioxide. That carbon is in the soil ready to help feed and nurture these plants that are growing. Especially if it's a garden, they love those things. They love that compost. So creating a composting program, I felt I'm giving other people the opportunity to also reduce their footprint and benefit the farm. So doing something like home composting is a great way to reduce your footprint and to, again, give a positive to the environment. Um, so let's get back to work. We can see the people, everybody here is working really, really hard to get this clear. Looks like we'll be done on time and we'll be able to plant out our sweet potatoes. During that time, I'm gonna bring over some of these sweet potatoes to give you a closer look at them. I'll hold them up in a minute. So this is the this is the variety of sweet potato I've been growing for many many years. It's called Beni Azuma, and it's very popular. And what you can see here is we have several different plants coming up out of the soil. It looks like there's five or six of them. And what we're going to be able to do is we're going to separate those out, and then we're going to be able to plant each one in the soil. So this one pot, which cost me 500 yen or about five dollars. Uh, we're going to be able to produce uh, like five or six different sweet potato plants. Now one sweet potato plant, once it's left in the soil, will produce anywhere from two to five to maybe even ten depending on how well it goes, sweet potatoes. So it's a really good deal. So in this pot I'm holding between uh, 20 and 50 sweet potatoes. What they probably did for this one was they actually buried part of a sweet potato and let it grow up into these uh, slips like this. But these other ones that are just individual one plant per pot, like this is the kintoki, what they've done is they've grown it out in a glass of water or in a pot of soil and then separated out the little different slips and then put those in the soil to start growing. Either way, that's a good technique. It's first year I'm growing these kintoki, I'm excited to see how they grow how big they get and uh, how they taste. That's the most important thing. 
And this is Beni Haruka. This is another different one that I'm not very familiar with, but it's growing in much the same way. You can see they've grown, the, the, they started the sweet potato itself in a glass of water or soil. And they separated the little slips out and then put them in the soil. But these are very, very healthy. I'm very happy to have found them. Again, each of these plants would produce between two and 10 sweet potatoes. So we've got a, gonna have a lot of sweet potatoes this year. And this is, uh, what is this, Anoimo? Yeah. Tomoko, can you read that? Is it Anoimo? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, Anoimo. <laughs> Again, this is the first year I'm growing this one, so I'm just gonna learn this year about this one. But uh, I think this is one of the really, really tasty ones, so we're excited to see how these go. And then the last variety is the, the purple sweet road. And you can even see in the picture how the inside of that sweet potato is purple. And I believe these are the same things I've grown before called Murasaki Imo, which is purple potato in Japanese, um, which are really, really good. And they're actually very healthy. Um, there's a woman who lives uh, the next village down the road about uh, 20 minutes, who uh, was very elderly. And a few years ago, I bought some slips from her that were purple potatoes. And I was lucky enough to get them and grow them out. And she was telling me how they're good for lots of different uh, things. I've been really impressed by um, the local people here and how uh, inventive they are and how connected they are to nature and their environment and uh, how in touch they are with how medicinal the natural plants are. Like the shiitake mushrooms are all growing for themselves, they're very medicinal. And every spring they go up into the mountains and they pick uh, wild vegetable plants and uh, baby plants, uh, baby ferns and things like that that are incredibly nutritive and uh, have actually medicinal properties. Uh, mugwort, for example, is uh, growing just about everywhere all over this place. And that's a very medicinal plant as well. So it seems that the people in the countryside, um, probably the world over, have this vast wealth of knowledge that's being forgotten every generation a little bit more and more. So I've been very fortunate to just kind of stumble into this and to start learning about these things. Um, I think it's not only vital, interesting, and, and uh, good for myself, but I think it's something that I, I'd like to share with everybody else if possible. Again, I'm not a professional in it. I'm just an amateur finding out for myself, but it's nice to be able to share my experiences with everyone because perhaps that'll inspire other people to find the same sort of uh, value in these simple things. I mean, for me, just sitting here, listening to the wind in the trees and the birds and the river, it's the best music in the world. I don't need anything else. And uh, drinking the water off the mountain, eating the vegetables from the farm, having my son come out here and help me out. I really couldn't ask for very much more than that. I mean, that's, that's the great life. Um, letting Junior here learn about uh, farming and uh, to go around and, to, and animals. Are you making your journal? Are you, what are you doing with this journal? What is it called? Uh, Kutsuki Animal Journal. It's called CAD. CAD. Because my name is Kaiser Junior. That's right. And what are we doing in this journal again? Uh, I'm trying to find good things. I'm trying to find animals in Kutsuki and I'm writing how big they are, what they do, and three interesting things, and are they good for the farm or not. Right, right. What do we have so far? Uh, ants and... An ant bees. pulling a caterpillar, because you're taking a photo. We have an ant pulling a caterpillar, right? And that's a, good guy. <laughs> and a carpenter bee, a carpenter frog. Bee. Carpenter bee, that's right. Are carpenter bees good for the farm? Uh, it's normal. It's normal. I think they're good because they're good pollinators. Good. What else? And a frog, that's right. Frog. A frog's good, bad, or neutral? Neutral. Neutral. Yeah. Ants are neutral, too. Yep. And uh, there's one no. You saw uh, not a dragonfly, a caddisfly? Yeah, I think a caddisfly. And we don't know if that's good or bad for the farm. Maybe neutral. Yeah. Uh huh. What else and do you want to find? Uh, definitely a hawk because it's the king of this, this ecosystem. Environment. That's right, it is the king. Yeah. Although we saw some crows chasing the crow, the king away before, right? Yeah. That's right. But actually, it's two versus one, so I think the crows will win that fight. Yeah. I don't know if, Brian, you can catch that, that hawk there on film. Maybe even turn up this camera so the people back home can see it. 
these hawks they just sit there on the on the streams of air and just hunting for snakes and lizards and frogs and whatever else they can see mice of course they're beautiful absolutely wonderful and it's really funny because the same birds live in Kyoto City and Kyoto City if you've ever been there has a wonderful river going through it called the Kamokawa the Duck River and uh, people love to sit out in the summertime on that riverside and have picnics well in picnics you got a sandwich or a rice ball or something in your hand and you're eating it you're talking to your friend and I know so many people who've been doing that and these hawks will come and swoop down and steal your sandwich. It's hilarious. I mean, this is a real thing that happens. Uh, I think I know why. Why? Why? Because Kutsuki has a lot of animals. And it Kyoto does. doesn't have so many mountains. So, uh, yeah. So there's no so much uh, animals. Mm -hmm. For them to eat, you mean? Yeah, that's why I think they take people's sandwiches or like what people eat. Right, right, right. But answer me this. How did they learn to do that? I think because they swoop down and try to catch mice like this. Yeah. Maybe okay. it look, for them, it, maybe they don't have so much good, like, uh, well, they have good eyesight. But they have really good eyesight, right? Maybe they don't have, they don't know so much about sandwiches and then they look like maybe mice. So they try to take it, I guess. Do you think they know what kind of sandwich the person has? Like they're flying up there like, oh, that's a ham sandwich, that's no, a tuna sandwich. Because they don't know what those are. That's Even they see the color, they don't know what they are. Right, because they don't know what ham is, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. Oh, okay. What time is it? Maybe 10 to. 10 to. Well, why don't we switch to questions then? Thank you, Junior. You want to help answer questions or yes. you want to go play? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, let's hear what the questions are. First question, I'll just read it. Okay. From Helene. From Helene, a question. Yes. Why didn't you decide to move to the countryside versus coming here? I don't know, Junior. Why didn't I decide to move to the countryside? This is the countryside. But I don't live here. Why not? Uh, maybe because you have a farm and you have a house, but maybe because you can't get so much uh, food and maybe... You don't want so much, uh, you don't want to, you know, get so much uh, weird things here. <laughs> That's true. I don't want so much weird things. And you can't get so much food. You can't get a lot of stuff. That's true. That's true. Well, maybe someday I'm going to move out here. And certainly every year, I think more and more about doing that. But right now, our family is really headquartered in Kyoto City, and we're pretty happy. And we have a nice house and then a nice neighborhood. And Junior's got a nice school and nice friend. Both my wife and I have a nice job. So I think we're we're happy to be in the city for now, but who knows what the future holds. Yeah. That's why it's called a present. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions coming up? No questions? How deep do you need to prepare the soil? Ah, thank you, thank you. How deep do I need to prepare the soil before planting? That's a very good question, and it's again very open-ended. It really depends on how deep you want to go. Um, the deeper if you go the too deep, it, the growing will be more uh, late later. So I think. But if you do it more, if you do it too high, it will get worse. So I think the middle is good. <laughs> good answer, Junior. The middle is usually the best, safest course, right? Yes. And what's the latest time you can plant? Well, let me first go back to the first question about how deep do you want to plant. I usually dig down at least 30 centimeters, about a foot. I think that's a good way to go. Um, the, the roots really tend to spread wherever they go. And if you do dig deeper, as Junior was saying, it gets harder because then you have sweet potatoes that are quite deep and they're hard to get out of the ground uh, because they go all the way to where the earth is compacted and they'll get stuck. And I've often broken sweet potatoes trying to get them out of the ground. So uh, you really have to find a comfortable depth for yourself, but I'd say recommended at least 30 centimeters. What was the next question, Brian? Uh, actually, I'm going back because oh. we'll ask some questions throughout. Oh, good. Um, Mark asks, what are the main pests that bother you for the Satsumaimo? Main pests. 
Monkeys. Junior, how do I feel about monkeys? He hates them. <laughs> I hate them more than anything. Oh, my gosh. In fact, I made Junior so scared the other day when we saw him in the car, and I was screaming at him from the car. Hey, you tell him. <laughs> I hate them. I hate them so much. They've, they've taken my food so many times. I'm just feeding the monkeys some years, it feels like. so. Monkeys are the main pest. Yeah. He said, get out of here! <laughs> Only 10 yeah. times louder, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't swear. So. But um, other than that, there are some insects that'll come onto the sweet potato plants, like caterpillars will, will eat the leaves, and butterflies. crickets butterflies. will eat the leaves, and uh, things like that. But fortunately, my sweet potatoes usually get started early enough to where if any, so anything you're growing is attacked by an insect, it really depends on the size of the plant is whether or not that plant's going to survive. If it's pretty well established, it can probably live through some insect attacks. So um, I haven't had any major problems with insects or anything like that. It's really just been monkeys up until now. And butterflies. <laughs> okay, ready for the next one? I think that's it for the chat questions. Okay. Is everyone on research? I can hear some people on microphone, but nobody's asking I'm, questions. So. I'm Other unmuted. Questions? Masako is unmuted. Say again. I'm unmuted. I'm sorry. Uh, what's the latest time you can plant? What's the latest time I can plant sweet potatoes? It depends on your region. Where I am, again, we have a real uh, cold, cold winter. So I don't want to plant sweet potatoes any later than June. So that's why I'm trying to get them in the ground as soon as possible. Because the sweet potatoes can grow for up to five months. But uh, we probably get about four good months of growth and then uh, we'll start harvesting. So if you have, I mean, sweet potatoes are indigenous to South America where there is in a lot of locations where there is no winter. So they grow year round. But here we grow eh, about three or four months. So I'd say the latest I can be planted is three or four months before your first frost date, which is usually, you know, it just really depends on where you're going. Questions? Okay, thanks, Junia. Any other questions for any, from anybody? What kind of composting will you use for sweet potatoes? Uh, I use the same compost for everything. Uh, it's basically just my own home mix of uh, composted vegetable waste with coffee chaff or leaves oh, no. or uh, rice chaff. Um, I do add a little bit of extra wood ash for the potassium to help the root growth. Anything that's a root vegetable like a carrot, a beet, a turnip, a radish, or a sweet potato or a potato, if you add a little extra potassium to the soil, usually you get better yields. You can also use bone meal if you, if you so choose. Anything else? What's our time, Brian? 5-2. Okay. Well, um, unless there are any other questions, I'll finish out by talking a little bit more about um, these rice fields. Um, we're basically at the bottom of a terrace rice field patty. There are about five or six rice fields above me that are terraced down, and this is kind of the lowest step. And then uh, off to my left here, there's a, a, a carp pond or a koi pond. And uh, this is full of fish. And one of the things I really like about the koi ponds is um, they, uh, they act kind of like in America, what we use uh, chickens and hogs for. Um, people, farmers will take their scrap vegetables and they'll uh, give them to the koi. And the koi will let the vegetables rot and then eat them up. And then their, uh, their feces will be used to, to fertilize the rice fields and the vegetable fields. So it's a pretty cool system here. And the koi are nice to look at as well. This is a very popular technique in Japan. I've never seen it in the West. So I think it might be uh, particular to Asia. Any other questions? No? 
Well, why don't we take a look up the hill here? You can see up the hill there, you can see the different terraced rice fields. And uh, it's common in Japan, in the, cult in the country, to see the, uh, the graves of the ancestors up on the hill as well. Um, it's very nice, I think, because people like to keep family close. And when people die, they like to be buried where they lived. I think that's wonderful. I mean, if I were farming for 50 or 60 or 70 years of my life, I'd probably want to be buried as close to my farm as possible as well. Um, I know that what's being coming more and more common now is they're selling mushroom suits. And when you die, you, they put a mushroom suit on you. And basically the, the mushroom mycelium consume your, your, your body and produce uh, good things for the environment. So that's a very interesting idea. And uh, yeah, I think that's gonna round it out for us today. I'm really happy to have had so many people come out and help me on the farm today. It's, it's been wonderful having people here. And I wanna say thank you to all of you who joined us here today on Zoom. Thank you very much for your great questions and for listening to me. And hopefully you've learned something. And even more hopefully you may become inspired to grow something on your balcony, do a little home composting or at least start buying more local organic vegetables because it is really better for your body and better for the planet. If you ever have any questions, you can find my website at midorifarm.net. Um, there's a Japanese and English page there. I'm also on Facebook at Midori Farm or Chuck Kayser. And uh, my Instagram account isn't so used, but it's there. And uh, you can also uh, find me on Airbnb experiences if you wanna come out and visit for a tour. And uh, every year we're going to grow a little bit more and a little bit better and hopefully spread the word that uh, this is possible. And this is great. It's fun and it's very important. So until then, until I see you again, thanks for joining us and keep watching. Chuck, just a question. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Mark is question. asking if we want to buy vegetables, do we do it through your website or how? Ah, yes. If you do want to purchase some of Midori Farms vegetables, please visit our website. Uh, you can contact me directly, but all the information is on the website, so I'd probably just direct you there anyway. Um, so yeah, midorifarm.net, and you can visit the uh, Buy Produce. Excellent. Thank you. It was great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Kim. And uh, like I said, Give us a shout, come and visit. Check out my YouTube channel as well, which is also Midori Farm. I've got some videos there on how to grow different things and stuff like that. So yeah, it just feels wonderful to be doing this. And I really hope more and more people can come out after this COVID nonsense is over and uh, we can get back to being a healthier uh, humanity. So thanks again.